Beta-hydroxybutyrate impacts many age-related phenotypes. But first, what is beta-hydroxybutyrate? That's what we'll see here. This is its chemical structure. And as its name suggests, it includes the short-chain fatty acid butyrate, as shown there. And then, to the left of the COOH functional group, it includes three other carbons at the alpha, beta, and gamma positions. At the beta position, it has that OH group, or a hydroxyl group. So putting it all together, we've got beta-hydroxybutyrate. All right, so I mentioned that beta-hydroxybutyrate impacts many age-related phenotypes. And that's what we'll see here. So beta-hydroxybutyrate has been shown to reduce inflammation, oxidative stress, and insulin resistance, which collectively have been shown to be good for the brain, heart, fat, muscle, kidney, and the pancreas. Additionally, beta-hydroxybutyrate is increased in animal models of longevity, which is what we'll start to see here, first starting off with data for mice on a ketogenic diet. On the y-axis, we've got beta-hydroxybutyrate circulating levels, and apologies that the image is a bit blurry. This is a screenshot from the paper, and if anyone's interested in the paper, I'll link to it in the video's description. And now on the x-axis, we can see that these mice were relatively old, 26 months, and then we've got three groups, C for the control diet, LC for low carb, and as we'll see in a minute, that was actually high fat, just not as high fat as the ketogenic group in K. And then we can see for the ketogenic diet fed mice, they had approximately two-fold higher circulating levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate when controlled with the control diet. And that's potentially important because in this study, a ketogenic diet extended lifespan, which is what we'll see here. On the y-axis, we've got percent survival plotted against age in days. And then in terms of those three groups, again, they were the control diet, ketogenic, and low carb. More specifically, the control diet was 17% fat, 89% fat for the ketogenic diet, and then that low carb diet, in quotes, was 70% fat. Still a relatively high fat diet, just not as high fat as the ketogenic fed diet. But note that these were isocaloric diets, and that's potentially important because when mice are fed a ketogenic diet, they become obese. So in order to minimize that occurrence, all of the groups were isocaloric, meaning they ate the same amount of calories. In terms of the effect on lifespan, first, let's put up a red line at 50% survival. This is median survival. This is the time when half of the mice have died and half are still alive. So first, at that point, 50% survival for the control diet, we can see that median lifespan was about 900 days. And this is good news because in many lifespan studies, the control strain is relatively short-lived, shorter than 900 days. And then the intervention may get the animals to 900 days, but is that really a lifespan extending effect if the controls are supposed to have a lifespan, a median lifespan of 900 days? So in this study, it's good news that the controls lived a median of 900 days. And then the ketogenic diet significantly increased or pushed lifespan out to the right with a median lifespan of 1,000 days. Here too, this beats the 900-day rule. And if you want more information on the 900-day rule and its importance in lifespan studies in mice, I'll link to that video in the right corner. But note that this isn't the only lifespan extending intervention that also has an increase for circulating levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate. That's also present in calorie-restricted mice. First, starting off with the data for beta-hydroxybutyrate circulating levels, which is what we've got on the y-axis. And then we've got two different diets. RD is the regular diet and CR is calorie-restricted mice. And here too, just like the ketogenic diet fed mice, we can see that calorie-restricted mice had about a two-fold increase for circulating levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate. Now, it's well known that calorie restriction extends lifespan, which is one example as shown here. And note that these data aren't from the same study. The beta-hydroxybutyrate data is from a different study relative to this CR study that I'm showing here. And if anyone's come across a study where they measured both beta-hydroxybutyrate and lifespan in the same study, please post it in the comments and I'd be happy to give you a shout out in a future video. Nonetheless, let's take a look at the lifespan data for calorie-restricted mice. On the y-axis, we've got survival probability, once again, percent survival, plotted against age. Let's put up that red line at median lifespan, or 50% survival, the time when half of the mice had died and half were still alive. And then we've got our two calorie-restricted groups, 20% and 40% CR, and we can see those significant increases for lifespan for the first, for the 20% calorie-restricted mice, and then for the 40% calorie-restricted mice. But note that these are just associations. In other words, we've got data that a ketogenic diet and a calorie-restricted diet extend lifespan in association 
for circulating levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate. Can we get closer to causation? In other words, is beta-hydroxybutyrate related to CR's lifespan extending effect? And in order to get closer to answering that question, we need to see that beta-hydroxybutyrate is produced by glucagon signaling, which is what we'll see here. So glucagon, starting at the top, binds to its receptor, the GCG glucagon receptor, R, GCGR glucagon receptor. And when it does that, it triggers an intracellular signaling cascade that leads to the production of beta-hydroxybutyrate. And this is particularly important because glucagon signaling is required for the lifespan extending effect of calorie restriction, which is what we'll see here. On the y-axis, we've got percent survival, and this is plotted against days alive. Let's put up that red line at median survival, 50% survival, the time when half the mice have died and half are still alive. And then we can see that for one of those groups, all of the mice were still alive, and that's calorie restriction, 15% calorie restriction, all of the mice were still alive after 550 days. And then we can also see for one of those groups that half of the mice had died. And this is the GCGR, or the glucagon receptor knockout mice. So these are calorie-restricted mice that had their glucagon receptor knocked out, and then correspondingly, there should be no intracellular glucagon signaling, and within this situation, we'd expect to see no or very low levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate. Note that calorie-restricted mice are not on a ketogenic diet, which is known to produce beta-hydroxybutyrate by increasing glucagon levels. Calorie-restricted mice, in this case, are on a standard high-carb diet. In order for calorie-restricted mice to have higher levels or increased levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate, they fast for up to 22 hours a day, eating the majority of their food within a very short window, two hours. So then this raises the question of how does beta-hydroxybutyrate vary during that 22 up to 22 hour fast? And that's a particularly important question because then it suggests that there may be an optimal fasting window or an optimal fasting duration for mice on a calorie-restricted diet to potentially gain some of the health and or longevity promoting benefits of a calorie-restricted diet. So to address that, let's take a look at how beta-hydroxybutyrate changes throughout the day in mice on a calorie-restricted diet with circulating levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate on the y-axis. And then this is in mice that have just eaten or following mice that had just eaten at six in the morning. At that time, beta-hydroxybutyrate levels are relatively low around 0.2 millimolar or 200 micromolar. And then for the first eight hours after fasting, after completing their eating, we can see that beta-hydroxybutyrate levels still stay around 0.2 millimolar. But then they start to increase 12 hours after fasting with a peak at 16 hours after fasting. At that time, beta-hydroxybutyrate levels are about three, threefold or three to three and a half times higher than where they started around 0.2 millimolar. So around 0.6 to 0.7 millimolar relative to around 0.2 millimolar. And then interestingly, beta-hydroxybutyrate levels don't stay relatively high as the fasting window continues up to 20 hours. And then we can see actually the beta-hydroxybutyrate levels in blood start to decline. But nonetheless, at that point, they're still 1.5 to 2 times higher than where they started around 0.2 millimolar. So when it comes to the optimal fasting duration in people, if we use the mouse data, beta-hydroxybutyrate increases from 12 to 20 hours of fasting, which then raises the question, is that an optimal fasting window in people, 12 to 20 hours, in order to get that systemic rise for circulating levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate? So to try to find out, I've been tracking it. And I'm not gonna show data in this video because I have less than a week's worth of data for now, but I'm gonna collect at least a month of data. And I've been using a ketone meter as shown there. I'm not sponsored or affiliated. This is just what I'm using. I don't know which one is best. This ketone meter does have some publications behind it. How well it compares to venipuncture, I'm not sure, but this is what I'm using for now. And in doing this experiment, I'm gonna see if I can play around with the fasting window going from 16 to 20 hours per day, but then also messing with fat intake. Now, I'm not on a ketogenic diet, and I know some of you will say, just go keto, cut, cut out all carbs. But if you see my biomarkers, that's not necessarily, that may not necessarily be a good thing. Plus, I'm a volume eater, so my current iteration of the diet, which contains around 40% fat, may be a bit higher if you include fat that's generated from fiber fermentation. That is best for my satiety and long-term calorie restriction adherence. But can I go higher for fat intake from 40 to 45%, maybe to 50 or 55%? Now, if I do that, one thing to consider is when I've gone higher fat up to about 120 grams per day in the past, 
that's led to an increase for plasma levels of glucose. So it doesn't make sense that I want to increase glucose levels, but also increase circulating levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate. And I know that may seem counterintuitive, cut carbs, increase fat, see a higher levels of glucose. But in my case, for whatever reason, the correlations suggest that higher levels of saturated fat and higher levels actually of what most people think of as a quote unquote heart healthy fat, monounsaturated fat, is significantly correlated with higher glucose in my data. And that's in more than 60 blood tests since 2015. So more recently, I haven't increased MUFA or sat fat, keeping them relatively low or towards the lower end of my range. Instead of increased omega-6 intake, not from seed oils, but exclusively from walnuts. So for now, glucose levels are relatively low. And last night I saw a trend upwards for circulating levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate, which suggests that I may be on the right track for keeping glucose relatively low and getting a small but potentially significant spike or increase for beta-hydroxybutyrate from around 0.2 millimolar to something higher. How much is optimal in people? Very debatable. But if I can get at least to 0.4 millimolar, even that two eggs doubling, Based on the data in calorie-restricted mice, it may be potential for health and or longevity. But the key variable there again is, what's the impact on other biomarkers? I'm not interested in improving glucose, beta-hydroxybutyrate, and having other biomarkers move in the wrong direction. Now, as one note of potential good news, more recently in my blood test, when I've increased fat intake just by about 15 grams per day, from 85 to 100 grams per day, that may be associated with a better CBD biomarker profile as triglycerides come down and lipoprotein A comes down, which would be expected to be contributing to a lower atherogenic risk. But here too, I'm not just interested in improving glucose, circulating levels of beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is what ketone meters are essentially measuring, and then the lipid profile or lipoprotein profile. What do other biomark biomarkers show within this context, including kidney, kidney, liver, immune, red blood cells, et cetera? So I'm planning on doing this experiment until the next blood test at the beginning of February, so stay tuned for that data. But then there's also an additional question that we may want to consider here. Is beta-hydroxybutyrate, is that spike in the middle of the night, is that optimal for slowing brain aging? And the reason I'm raising that question is because there's emerging data that beta-hydroxybutyrate may improve glymphatic function, which is the brain's waste clearance system that's active during sleep. Those data are just more recently being published, so it's an emerging story. I don't have a video planned for it yet, but that's on the radar, so stay tuned for that video at some point in the near future. If you've ever wondered what's optimal for biomarkers, we'll have a new Patreon tier dedicated specifically to that. It currently includes the 35 biomarkers shown here, more than two hours of video content, 52 published references, and these aren't the reference ranges which you can get from any LLM these days. This is what may be optimal based on how each of these biomarkers changes during aging and or associations with all-cause mortality risk in the largest published studies that exist. So if you're interested in that, check it out. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon, where I offer blood test consults and also post at least twice per day in four other Patreon tiers. We've also got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself that help support the channel, including ultalabtest.com, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests done, the clearly filtered water filter, which I use every day, at-home metabolomics, I'm up to 22 tests, oral microbiome composition, NAD testing with Genfinity, epigenetic testing with True Diagnostic, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, which includes GrimAge, the best epigenetic clock of epigenetic clocks, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, including Data is My North Star, Figuring Stuff Out is My Drug, which I've got on here, and the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying logo, link in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.